a darling of fictional navies everywhere, the aircraft carrying submarine or submarine aircraft carrier was in reality a bit of a flop. Large and unwieldy, these were submarines that suffered as submarines to gain a limited ability to carry and launch aircraft. While many different nations experimented in this direction, only one, Imperial Japan, really made a go for it. It's probably telling, really, that the Japanese were the only ones to do so. Regardless, this was an interesting concept, and certainly one worth taking a second look at. Another of my very old videos brought back here as a backup should my experiment this weekend faceplant. Anyway, as a concept, there were really three different uses for such a submarine, two of which, again, largely focused in Japan, though one was at least tested by other navies. That one was scouting. The idea of carrying a seaplane or two for the purpose of long-distance recon, be it hunting for targets or scouting for the fleet proper. That varies on the Navy. The British tried the concept with HMS M2. The United States trialed flow planes on USS S1. Both proved to be failures. Either way, this role is arguably the one where at least in the interwar years, it kind of made sense. Because, simply put, this was a time before radar, and when sonar was still in its infancy as well. The ability to carry an aircraft to search out targets was somewhat useful, especially in the Pacific, where vast distances were the norm. It's not a surprise that multiple navies at least gave the idea some thought. Though again, only the Japanese pursued it in large scale. Which is also not a surprise when one considers Japan's scouting doctrine. In American doctrine, the carriers would have scout bombers. Typically dive bombers, like the Dauntless, with extra fuel and limited weaponry. Those would be sent out ahead of the fleet to try and identify enemy targets. The Japanese, by contrast, dedicated their carriers to attack and defense. Scouting was instead given over primarily to cruisers. The entire existence of the Tones was a result of this doctrine. There's a reason that at Midway, it was aircraft from the cruisers scouting for the American fleet. Regardless, the Japanese also like using their submarines as picket ships. A scout aircraft could be useful for that role. Though it is worth noting that the Japanese dedicated submarines with aircraft for use as squadron command ships. Where the aircraft played more of a support role to help scout for the squadron as a whole. Even in this role, however you're still getting a much larger boat than is strictly necessary. A submarine that has to carry all the spare parts and equipment along with fuel for an aircraft, in addition to its own supplies. When it's just one scout, this isn't too big a deal, though it does still inherently limit the submarine. In fact, on the Type B submarines, the Japanese removed the aircraft facilities later in the war, at least on some of them. And yet, despite this, it didn't stop the Japanese from going a step further. I'm fairly certain that most people watching this video have at least heard of the I-400 class. Probably in some YouTube or old military channel documentary about and I quote, the largest submarines of World War II, Japan's submersible superweapon. While a favorite of early 2000s military documentaries and clickbaity YouTube channels, the I-400s are still an interesting beast. 
a triumph of technology for their time, to be sure, though they were still an inefficient design and an arguable waste of the materials put into building them. While I'm not going to go into huge detail on the ships here, I'll at least touch on them, namely on the idea there was intended to be 18 of them for coordinated strikes, leaving aside for the moment that even if all 18 were finished, at least some of them would be on different missions or refit, that's about 50 aircraft between them, which is half as many as a proper fleet carrier, though it does depend on the specific carrier. Spread between 18 utterly massive submarines that you have to train outsized crews for. In addition to needing pilots who can fly their seaplanes properly. But let's say Japan managed to get all of them done anyway and use them in a mass strike. That's one half of one wave of the Pearl Harbor attack, so you're really only getting much use out of them for terror bombing. Barring hitting something like the locks of the Panama Canal, the actual mission later in the war. By which point, the Japanese had radically scaled back their plan. In fact, it only took about a year for 18 to be reduced to 5, only 3 of which would be completed. One can argue the entire reason for these boats was a reflection of reality the Japanese realized they couldn't hit the continental United States with proper carriers. They didn't have the oiler capacity even before losses added up. On top of the inherent risk of sailing that deep into hostile territory. Thus, a stealthy submarine aircraft carrier that was really best used for terror bombing. While the boat itself was a bad compromise in its roles. Too large and unwieldy to be effective as a submarine, while only carrying three aircraft for the carrier role. This was an impressive technological achievement, and I don't intend to take away from that. However, they're caught between their duties with all the compromises inherent to that issue. See, for example, battle carriers as another option. There was also the smaller Type A Mod 2, or Type AM, though this is apparently inaccurate. These were an outgrowth of the more conventional Type A submarine, in order to carry two aircraft. Somewhat similar to a smaller I-400, but a totally unrelated design. Regardless, let's wrap things up now with the third role for a submarine carrier. One related to, but not identical to, the first one. With this one coming to us from France. Land of, no one copies the French because they do their own thing. In this case, the topic in question is Sir Couf, A cruiser submarine which was a pretty common interwar design. Most, however, were simply larger than average submarines, with big guns ranging from 5.5 inch to 6.1 inches, 140 millimeter to 152 millimeter respectively. Those boats suffered from some of the same issues the I-400s would later face, namely being a bit too large and in charge for their own good. Often they were slow to submerge and not particularly agile, which isn't exactly ideal for a submarine. This is true of most cruiser submarines. As noted, the French are a fan of doing their own thing, and this resulted in Sir Couf. She carried a turret ahead of the conning tower with two 8-inch or 203mm guns, larger than any of the other cruiser submarines, and a reflection of the French wanting to use her quite literally as a submerged cruiser. 
More importantly for this video, it's why the boat also carried a small hangar for a single float plane, partially for scouting akin to the Japanese. But the French wanted to use it for gunnery spotting as well. Sir Kouf, as a submarine, naturally lacked a high spotting position. To get the best use out of her big guns, a spotting aircraft was almost a necessity. It would guide fire in on distant targets, just like a similar plane on a cruiser or battleship. It makes sense if you accept the idea of a cruiser or carrier submarine in general. As I said, these were always going to be a bit of an inefficient mashup. Too large to function as a capable submarine, while too small to carry a proper amount of strike aircraft. To pop back to I-400 for a moment. Had all 18 originally planned boats been built, that would have been somewhere between 90 and 100,000 tons. You could have gone several aircraft carriers for that much work. It shows Japan's desperation, but also how this idea was inherently flawed from the start. I will admit that the Japanese got good use out of their smaller submarines. The older ones that had a small hangar for one or two scouts. But then again, were those submarines successful because of their scouts? Or were they successful because they were better designed submarines? Did I-19 sink Wasp and damage several other ships because she had a seaplane? Or because she happened to be in the right spot to get a good spread? While the small hangar single plane submarines could get good mileage out of their scouts, the fact of the matter is they're inherently inefficient compared to a submarine that lacks the plane. And after radar started filtering down to submarines, carrying a scout became a luxury they didn't really need. The interwar years were the sweet spot where a plane on a submarine could be argued as useful for scouting. It was a product of the time, really. That isn't to say I don't understand why this concept is still in the popular imagination. It makes for a unique thing to play around with in video games or other media. There's nothing quite like the mission in Crimson Skies where you have to sink HMS Barracuda by destroying the hangar while fending off her own fighters. And one can never forget the numerous times Ace Combat throws super subs carrying fighters at you. Just keep in mind, there's a very real reason why, oddball Cold War designs aside, the idea ended with I-400. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.